So yeah, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laura Caroline Delara, the Interim Director at DePaul Art Museum, and I am honored to introduce tonight's speaker, artist Dushko Petrovich. Um, in addition to this evening's program, DePaul Art Museum has a wealth of upcoming um, virtual events as part of our Latinx American exhibition and our Latinx initiative, um, including discussions about the US-Mexico border and its peripheries, with the Dignity Craft Collective next Thursday, um, and a conversation between artist and curator Pablo Hoguera and Professor Daniel Quiles on April 8th, um, for which we hope you'll also join us. With, um, you know, if you're wanting more information on our programs and our temporarily virtual exhibitions, um, then that can be found at artmuseum.paul.edu. And I also want to note that if you'd like closed captions for this evening's talk, um, that there should be a live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to, uh, to help you with that. Um, but for this evening, I am so pleased to present uh, to all of you Dushko Petrovich, um, who is a co-founder of Paper Monument, where he's published numerous critically acclaimed and best-selling books, um, including Draw It With Your Eyes Closed, The Art of the Art Assignment, Social Medium, Artist Writing from 2000 to 2015, and as radical as mother, as salad, as shelter, what should art institutions what should art institutions do now? Petrovich has produced Adjunct Commuter Weekly and the Daily Gentrifier under his personal imprint DME. He has written about art and visual culture for many publications, including N Plus One, Book Forum, Art in America, Art News, and the New York Times. His work has been exhibited in galleries and museums nationally and internationally including the Cheta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw, the De, De Cordova Museum and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston at Gallery 400 in Chicago, and has been reviewed in publications such as Art Forum, Artnet, The New Yorker, The New York Times, among many others. Petrovich is um, on the artistic team for Front International 2022 and the Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art, where he will oversee the publication program. Having previously taught at Boston University, Yale University, and the Rhode Island School of Design, Petrovich currently chairs the New Arts Journalism Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dushko, we're so pleased to have you with us and thank you so much for being here. I know you've been on a number of Zoom talks this week, so I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and we'll have time for um, questions at the end as well, but if you all wanna ask questions um, throughout, feel free. Um, and with that, Dushko, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, it's always like weird to hear all your stuff <laughs> listed. <laughs> oh my God. Um, seems like another person. Um, thanks thanks to, uh, to you guys for inviting me. It's really an honor to be a part of this and especially during the pandemic to be able to like talk about what you're doing and connect with people is super important. And I'm especially uh, happy to be included in this um, Latinx um, American kind of rubric. A lot of times because of my name, people don't realize I'm from Latin America. And so kind of like running around incognito sometimes. Um, so that feels nice. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone for coming. It's really moving to see different people from different parts of my life showing up on the Zoom. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you. And this is like a project that's in progress. So I'm just going to in related a little bit to some previous things and then show you what's been going on. And then I look forward to chatting about it. Um, let me do the screen share. Um, is that working? It's always so weird, okay. Um, yeah, so this is like a, a group of paintings I'm calling screen grab paintings for lack of a better term. It's just direct, like what, what happened. Um, and some of you might know the previous work I've done that um, Laura Caroline was, was describing. And I'm gonna talk about it in a kind of oversimplified way just to show a little bit how it might relate to the paintings. Um, Adjunct Commuter Weekly, which you see on the left. Um, oh wait, I think I wanna do slideshow view, right? That's better. So you see the big pictures now, right? 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, Adjunct Commuter Weekly um, presents the realities of adjunct professorship in the U.S. The the brutal reality of it, in the form of a like sort of aspirational news weekly publication and um, the Daily Gentrifier, which you see on the right, presents again similarly the realities of gentrification in in this was the New York LA edition um, using the aesthetics like the kind of hyper artisanal uh, hipster aesthetics that are normally used to cover up gentrification. So that's kind of a mode that I've used in some of my publications. And then similarly um, in a painting project that actually preceded um, those publication projects, El Oso Cardinal um, was a gigantic Ecuadorian bus um, kind of rubric. I grew up in Ecuador and left when I was six. And so I've always felt like I had this kind of cultural framework or imprint that I was carrying around, but then I lived the rest of my life outside of Ecuador and took on all these other characteristics. So what I did in this painting was I used the kind of standard Ecuadorian bus rubric that I grew up with where the driver would put all the stuff that he was interested in on the bus. And I put all the stuff that I that I had done or that had happened to me, my my schools, nicknames I had, my favorite scarf, things like that. Um, and it was all non-Ecuadorian stuff. So it was this kind of, I guess, tension or relationship between a certain kind of rubric and the lived experience that um, that I was fitting into that rubric. So it was a kind of an autobiographical painting um, via analogy. Um, here you can see um, a couple of the details. The On the left is the um, mascot from my junior high school. That's the, the Perrysburg yellow jacket. Um, I, my high school history teacher, Dr. Trotter is here, but um, that was from Bexley Lion, which is like cut off there to the left. That's the blue Bexley Lion of where I went to high school. Um, and then that P is like a kind of script chrome P that was, I forget the exact typeface, but it was something that was popular um, in like American cars in the 60s and 70s. So it's kind of an American chrome uh, font. So it was this kind of trompe l'oeil project with, with these switched out cultural signifiers. Um, and then in the last few years, you know, like everyone, I think I've been on the internet a lot and um, one of the things that I noticed was in the early days of the algorithm, which was kind of the phrase that I lifted to refer to this body of work, a lot of the social media feeds were connecting um, to disparate posts in ways that seemed kind of overly significant or overly similar, overly, overly charged. So, you know, I just started clipping them out basically with screen grabs. Um, when I saw them, when something caught my attention, you can see the one on the left is obviously, you know, crazy Ted Cruz at the bottom doing like this. And the top has this thing about a material that could create quantum optical computers. And so, of course, you read them together as a kind of horror of like more internet and more computing and more uh, Ted Cruz. And Ted Cruz, the hashtag there is doom. So, um, that was one. In the middle there is a set of paintings and drawings from Mira Shore, the great artist and critic and publisher. Um, and she has these like, I don't know, little orange breasts and then below it some um, Peter Rostovsky, <laughs> I don't know what he was doing, uh, put this uh, pumpkin man with pumpkin breasts at the bottom. And it's obviously like too, too similar to Mira's um, thing. So I cut that one out. Um, and then on the right is a pretty bleak one um, about Frederick Douglass's faith in photography. And then weirdly, like a fairly similar looking man below um, who, who was like a, a attack. I don't even know if that was the same person or that was just a, like an image that they had had, but that was a really kind of brutal um, kind of juxtaposition about, I don't know, the dystopia of 
the circulation of images and racism and and that kind of thing. So I kind of thought about these as like basically a collage project, um, except instead of like cutting out two things and putting them together, I was finding the two things that had been put together and cutting out around them, you know? So I think that's sort of one of the things that started um, this kind of screen grab practice, which, you know, everyone does, I think. And it's just, I think, a part of being online nowadays. But I started to think about it more as a part of my work at this point. And I got really involved with trying to figure out how to like show these or translate them or transpose them or move them. And it was actually pretty frustrating. Like I couldn't, when I would put them back on social media, they would just sort of disappear again into the into the feed. Um, that didn't seem to work. And then I tried various photographic reproductions and I came up with some fairly satisfactory things, but nothing really felt completely right. So I just sort of had this project on hold. Um, and then concurrently, I had this like folder on my desktop, you know, as one does, that was just called screen grab paintings, because it was like stuff screen grabs that I wanted to paint. Um, and, you know, at first, it was just like that instinctive, like, this would be fun to paint, this would be interesting to paint, this would be difficult to paint. Um, and they were also just things that really stuck with me. I don't know how else to describe it, just kind of images, charts, historical moments that I just couldn't shake that really got to me, you know? I mean, we're all spending so much time on the internet, but these were kind of relics of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, deep experiences that I had on the internet, you know? So, um, you know, now that I look at them, they have like interrelationships that are sort of obvious in retrospect. But um, at the time I, I was literally just sort of cutting things out that I liked and putting them in this folder. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about native land map. That was one of the first ones. Um, there's this lithium grid, which is a photo of lithium mining in Brazil that looks like these color field paintings that have been lied down. Um, the dictator monument, I just renamed them things that were like easy for me to remember is, um, a refashioned, uh, monument of, um, of a dictator. The wage theft is this chart that was going around that was basically comparing wage theft, which is, you know, a bigger problem by many, many factors than like regular theft, you know, like when we go into a store and steal something. Um, there's Bannon wearing the mask and appearing via video in, in court uh, as a court sketch. So I, I like that, this crazy um, image of a white leather chair with these glowing eyes. Um, there's a couple of sort of satellite photos. One is of the George Floyd protests when they were doing surveillance um, of those protests from the air and someone was tracking that. And then another photo where um, Israeli military facilities were bl being blurred out, which was like proving that they were military facilities while also um, obscuring the details of what was there. So anyways, it's kind of, you know, each of you would probably have your own collection of these. Um, and for a while it was just sitting there, um, you know, like a back burner type of project. And I think part partly the pandemic and just being isolated and being in the studio and being on so many Zooms, I got the, pe the feeling that I should um, paint them, you know, in a, in a way to feel contact with something physically, you know, um, painting really does that. And in a weird way, I feel like I sort of re reintroduced myself to painting um, by making these paintings. So I started um, with native land map. It just felt extremely pressing to me. Um, we're obviously going through an era of, of increased recognition of, of the genocide of Native Americans and, and new technologies that allow us to learn more and better about how that happened. And nativelandmap.ca is this great site where you can um, you know, plug in your location and see uh, which native people's land 
you're on basically. And, you know, it's a great app. And I was just struck also just by the visual beauty of it, the complexity, the, the implication of all the lost um, cultures, just the, the, the violence um, and the way that that all came across as a visual system with, um, you know, overlapping territories uh, with various historical epochs kind of inscribing themselves on the app. And you know how it is. I just, I was having all those thoughts and then I took a screen grab, right? But um, later when I was painting it, it was this way of kind of re reliving and re-examining and being very particular about all of those kinds of details and lifting it into this more physical realm. Um, I did it as a very large watercolor. I don't remember the exact measurements. It's probably about 35 inches tall and maybe 70 or so inches across. Um, and I initially thought it was just a sketch. Like I, I was like, I'm gonna, this is gonna be really bad. I'll just, I'll just try one. Um, but the more I got into it, the more I just sort of accepted a lot of the inaccuracies and mistakes that I made because, you know, obviously I'm, I can't compete with the actual native landmap.ca, which is, you know, this brilliant internet project. All I can do is make this kind of record of my experience of it. So that's really what I focused on more. And I, I do think there was something uh, to it. Uh, I'll, I'm going to click ahead to um, a detail. This is, you know, Chicago and, and Lake Michigan um, with the overlapping um, uh, overlapping areas, um, you know, which are um, in Chicago, it, it's, it's the Kickapoi, Peoria, Potawatomi, uh, Miami, uh, and Ochesi, Sakoan people. So it's kind of um, many layers uh, going on top of each other. And I don't know, I, I cut this, I screen grabbed this badly because I grew up in Toledo, which is like just over to the right a little bit. And so quite of a similar um, area. And it was obviously just something to, to think about and meditate on. Um, and you can see kind of where the mistakes are and you know where I misdrew things and stuff like that. And at a certain point, I just decided that that was part of part of what I was talking about. Um, this is one of my favorite, like favorite, most interesting, most painful parts to think about, uh, which is present day Oklahoma and where you can see the sort of smaller, more Euclidean rectangular um, areas. Those are like the little tiny rectangular um, reservations that were made for Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cree, um, and Cherokee reservations. So I don't know when I got to that, that was something actually that when I was looking at the big thing online, I wasn't quite getting, but when I had to kind of paint in these smaller little rectangular areas within these much larger, um, you know, more amorphous rounded spaces, it just, I don't know how else to say it. It just really hit me. So, um, I like that, that kind of detail on the map. So that's one, this is, this took me the first semester. This is all stuff I'm basically doing uh, like everybody else, like between Zooms and between childcare and, and just getting by. Um, but it did feel, you know, good. I don't know, maybe good is an exaggeration, but it felt meaningful to just sort of keep going back to this and have some level of physical continuity in a time that's been so, um, disorienting and, and, and kind of weird, um, you know, being online or alone so much of the time. So um, this is kind of just a different um, relationship. Um, this is the second one I've been working on kind of this semester. Um, I'm in, you know, my name for it is just Texas Immigration Center, but it's a photo, um, I have to look, this is called the El Paso del Norte Processing Center. So this is a, a processing center on the north side of El Paso um, where the uh, 
Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General did a surprise visit and found uh, 900 detainees were being held in a space that was made for 125 people. So I, I must have been reading this article about that discovery and the kind of the expose of it. And this was the photo that was taken, as far as I can tell, was taken by the, the inspector general of, of the Department of Homeland Security. And they put in these white rectangles to block out people's faces uh, to preserve their anonymity in the document. So it's kind of a form of you know government redaction. Obviously here, I'm in favor of the preservation of the anonymity of the de detainees, but it was also just extremely jarring and striking as an image. And, um, you know, the white rectangles have a function in this image, but they also seem to relate to just whiteness. And, you know, again, those rectangles actually that of the reservations that were in that last picture, um, uh, just as a kind of, you know, flattening and whitening of, of people that happens, I think, you know, in in various ways through genocide, through assimilation, through um, immigration, all the bureaucratic processing and all of that. It just was one of these images that just struck me and I couldn't um, get it out of my head. So I decided to try to paint it, which has been um, very difficult, just not just technically, but emotionally to like, to, to look at this image and think about, um, you know, what these people were going through. and. The removal of the faces weirdly kind of allows you this strange kind of voyeuristic um, experience of, you know, noticing how their hands are, noticing how their feet are, noticing um, what kind of clothes they're wearing and everything like that. So, you know, the, the most I can do, I have felt, is to just be um, faithful to what was happening in that room and, and to try to kind of notate it um as as best as i could the um you know this is obviously in its early early stages i it's hard for me to understand how long it'll take it's i it's like one layer at this point so it's going to take a long time um this passage is a little bit more finished and you know what i was just noticing which i didn't notice in fact the first time i saw the image was just that everyone's holding a little white square which is their some kind of ticket or number or something that they're probably going to have to present later on um, and how that related to the white squares that have been laid over the top of the image. Um, and so I've just obviously tried to stay, you know, faithful to, to notating um, that relationship. So um, yeah, this one, it's just, it's just started really, um, but I wanted to show it just in the spirit of talking about what I was doing and I think it has a relationship, pretty strong relationship to that first image. Um, so yeah, this I'll end with this. This is just a detail of the um, of the hands. Um, and then I everyone has two bracelets. I haven't researched. There's a green bracelet and a yellow br bracelet. So I guess I should also say that one of the things that I've done um, as I make the paintings is kind of take them as a kind of research syllabus or a kind of research um, plan for myself, just because I feel like um, with any of these things, there's just so much ignorance and self-education that has to happen. And I don't know, you know, the internet is good and bad for those things. So this has just been my way of noticing what it is that I cared about that felt visually powerful to me and you know, significant in other ways, and then just trying to follow that lead as much as possible. So I say that, but I haven't, I haven't yet researched um, the bracelets and the exact meaning of it, but I have noticed that if you look closely, they're all wearing um, the same two, the same two bracelets and where I can find everyone's hands, they seem to be holding um, these little white tickets. Um, so yeah, so that's it. It's very much in uh, what's the Latin in media res. Um, and I just wanted to share and talk about them in part so I can understand uh, 
what I'm doing and what people think about it. So I will, um, well, I guess, I don't know, should I stop share? Should I, I can go backwards and forwards in this slideshow based on uh, people's questions. Um, yeah, this is perfect. Thank you so much, Dushka. Sure. I think, um, yeah, it's helpful maybe to leave them up for now while we're talking through it so, so we can go back in details. But yeah, if anybody has questions and you wanna put them in the chat, um, then we're, you know, happy to go through them, obviously. But it's this is really, I feel so sort of privileged that you, you know, were willing to share this really early work and such new work with us, because I know that that um, can be such a vulnerable spot for so many artists. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this. And it's, it's yeah, the, the these images in particular are just so striking for everything that's been in the news as of late and the way that you're that you're portraying it's it's incredible thank you yeah thanks for having me any questions yet i should credit yoni too because when we talked about like what i could talk about she jumped on this it was like I meant, you know, my normal thing is like a scrambly mess of like 17 projects, you know, and I just started rambling and she was like that one. So thank you, Yonit, for, for, for being magnetized. Do you go back to the um, full image of it, Dushka? Sure. And I guess too, having kind of seen um, your behind the scenes screenshot folder <laughs> and, and what you've been saving, are there ones that you feel, like obviously there's sort of that initial um, reaction to the image to make you wanna save it in the first place. But um, in these first few paintings that you've started on, have you noticed that you have um, kind of stuck with within this particular type of theme in terms of um, kind of geographies and, and your depiction of, you know, different peoples or are there like other pictures that we're just not seeing within this presentation itself that are sort of on a completely different trajectory? I mean, it's funny, I guess um, there is definitely like a center of gravity around sort of Latin American migration, indigeneity, those kinds of things. Um, but it's also like more general. The one, the sort of the next one on the docket for me is, is yeah, I say the docket and it is literally Steve Bannon um, testifying in handcuffs. Um, you know, and there there is like a, there's a visual weird thing there too, which is that he has the white, mask on you know not that masks are bad signifiers of whiteness but it's like it it did strike me that it 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 got me in a similar zone and obviously bannon is one of the like architects although that's like such a an offense to architecture uh one of the uh killers you know one of the one of the murder planners uh around a lot of this stuff so um you know it's yeah, so I think there is that, you know, but obviously the George Floyd image of the the, the satellite image of those things and the the one of the um, the kind of Israeli military facilities, those are different um, in terms of who's being targeted, I guess, precisely. But obviously there's a theme running through it. Um, yeah, it's weird. And I don't know, I mean, the white leather... Um, there's like a white leather entertainment center seat. I mean, you know, probably if you stick that image with these other images, it reads in a particular way to be about race and that kind of thing. And and maybe it is. I w I wouldn't um I wouldn't deny that reading. But um, it was also just like a pandemic. Like, oh my God, you know, we're all sitting in chairs, staring at screens, kind of image. So at least right now, it's just sort of a weird mix, a very pretty personal mix of like things that I, you know, grabbed onto. Um, I have other collections of screen grabs, but they're more, 
they're related to other things, you know, like I, I closely monitor certain, um, cultural, um, you know, fights and things like that. So I have, I think the world's greatest collection of Coco Fusco and Martha Rosler, like sort of fighting and also being friends on Facebook and saying very weird things to each other, you know, like, so, but I'm not going to paint that, you know, that's like a different, um, different collection, I guess, you know, these were ones that seem to relate to painting. Um, so um, we've also got, uh, Francisco, if you want to um, just unmute yourself, you're also welcome to ask the question um, out loud instead of in the chat, if you want to do that and, rather than typing. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I was realizing it was going to take me too long to type this. Um, <laughs> hi, Dushko. Um, I, uh, I just realized I really missed listening to you in class last semester. So it's, it's nice to hear you here. Thank you. Um, so thank you for sharing your work. Uh, I, I think it's awesome. I um, I guess I'm curious about the level of detail that you choose to paint in these because you find these images online and then just screen grab them, right? Like, or do you look for other images of the same scene to try to find one with better angles or what? Oh, you know, I've never done that. I just, it's it's really pretty. Like, you know, grab it. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I figured because um, in your process, there's a certain level of, of detail. So if, uh, do, do you go and edit these images to try to figure out, uh, you know, you were mentioning the bracelets and that everybody in this image is holding a little ticket. Uh, so there is, there's a lot of, of research involved too. And I wonder just how you think about that when it translates to your painting. Yeah, it's funny, you know, painting always has this kind of, um, I'm not a philosopher, but it has this kind of, um, what's the word? Um, someone's gonna be able to help me here, like a kind of um, epistemological moment, um, you know, where it's about knowledge, you know, and visual knowledge. And for me, I often experience that in the, in the, like the attempt to, to close in it's, it's particularly funny with, with photography because there's like two, you know, epistemological visual systems happening at the same time. And one is trying to approach the other one. And in this case, it's photography as, as mediated by, um, by the internet. And I guess in, in, a, in a couple of cases with the images, it's like a courtroom sketch mediated by photography then on the screen. Um, and my only kind of resolution for that is to just try to be as faithful to the image itself as I can. Um, but I say that, and I've also fudged it a little bit. Like the 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 native land map was 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 m much easier in the sense that it was like color washes, and where it's not a color wash, that's just my mistake. And you can kind of tell that I put the line in the wrong place or I got too much paint on there or whatever, because everyone can kind of understand that it came from a flat color wash. Um, with the Texas Immigration Center, um, it was more, it was kind of more ticklish because if you do zoom in very much on this image, it's a grid of pixels, you know, um, like all internet images are. Um, and I could have, maybe come up with a kind of, you know, very fussy system for rendering the images in that way. But I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that that wasn't what I, that wasn't what struck me, you know, that wasn't what the, the, the knowledge, the, the kind of knowledge that was being presented to me was. And so I basically tried to make it look like how it looks when I look at the screen, you know, like, which is isn't not not scientific, but that's been my kind of my compass point um, with 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 that. Um, and yeah, it also didn't. I it's part of why I didn't look for a better image. It's because it was really just the image that got me, and the image that got me already was sufficient. Like it didn't didn't have to be the better version or anything like that. So. Um, 
Yeah, I hope that answers your question, but that's kind of the, the rationale. Um, um, I, should I look at the chat or no? I can, I can do it for you if you want, so you okay. don't worry about it. Um, so Roger White is asking, um, he said that he really likes what you said about the physicality of painting being part of this. Uh, and then it makes you and us relate to the images in a different way, maybe noticing more, absorbing and reflecting more slowly. Uh, given the state of the world in which we aren't seeing art in real life so much right now, does that change the idea or function of physicality in relation to this project? Um, he says because it strikes him that uh, even seeing them on the screen here, I think I feel whatever that effect is. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Roger, uh, best friend and co-founder of Paper Monument. Um, uh, great question. You know, as soon as you say that, I realize that these pictures and even like the decision to make them now and everything was just kind of a, a love letter to the future on some level. Like, like, I hope that I can show these. I hope that people can be in rooms together and and look at physical objects, you know, and weirdly, I, I, I maybe wasn't focusing on that as much before the pandemic. I got really busy with other things, but it kind of hit home, you know, to, so to speak, um, during pandemic and, and, and they are, you know, I mean, it's funny to present them this way. I was like, oh my God, I'm doing screen grabs and I'm painting them and then I'm show, you know, on a zoom, um, that's, I'm not really trying to get into some kind of like, crazy internet loop there. The, the real goal would be for people to see them and like you say, to have like a different physical experience. Also away from their computers and away a little bit, I think also from the Trump era. Um, and just, I, 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 I genuinely felt a, um, this feels kind of whatever inflated to say, but I genuinely felt like a responsibility to record some of the things that we all saw and went through during those times. I mean, it's a lot of it's continuing, obviously, but there, there was a way in which that time was marked by a particularly, you know, virulent um, set of ideas. And I felt a responsibility to kind of put those in the diary in a way, you know, and, and just say, like, I saw this. Um, and, you know, I wasn't the photographer in that detention center, or I didn't build native map, you know, I didn't generate these images, but I felt like somehow I had to say, I saw them, I received them, you know, it, it, it impacted me. Um, in part, because I assume that everybody's been going through something like that, you know, like where you just see these things and it really changes your whole, um, your whole being, you know. That's actually a really nice um, segue into Nicolay's question, um, who says that appreciates the presentation and then asks whether the process of working through these works has proven to be more cathartic or more of a way to process how the mediation of all these rather heavy and impactful snapshots just pass through our screens on a rather quotidian way. You know, it's weird. I mean, I think that it's um, part of part of the project was like to 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 not like just see a million things on the internet and then not see them again, because you know I'm guilty of that, like everybody is. And there were just certain things that seemed to me for me they just deserve to be lifted out and and considered. So I think that I've that's, that's been part of it is to just not do that on some simple level and, um, record, record them, you know, as best I could, um, through a medium, you know, that I can use. Um, and I don't know what to say about the time spent with them and everything like that. I, I'm usually very suspicious of projects that like seek to justify themselves in the artist not the greatest hits, like the greatest hits of that are the greatest hits. I don't question the great um, endurance performance people and stuff. All of that is super legitimate, but I don't know, somehow with painting, I never quite bought into the, the kind of like time spent thing. Um, so I don't really have a justification 
for it, but I did feel like, again, like on some personal level that that was my responsibility right now. And I hope that through the slowness and, you know, I'm not the most meticulous person. So it's also been like a kind of, you know, trial for me to like be more meticulous and, um, you know, be more painstaking and careful about things. Um, so that's, I think part of it is like, I don't know, it's the weird thing with any kind of art making, right? Where you're, you're making the thing, but you're also like hoping that it's making you or like improving you on some weird level. Um, so that was kind of part of the bargain for me was like, you know, please God, like improve me, <laughs> improve me, you know, like, um, I devote myself to this object and, and, you know, let it, let it also have an effect on me. You know, I don't, I don't expect, like I said, I don't expect that to like add anything to anybody else, but if it does, then, then I, I'll take it. Great. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so Fernando also had a question, um, but was wanting to ask it in the mic. Fernando, are you there? You want to ask? Hi. Hi, Dushko. Hi. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, so you mentioned it about like uh, the photographs and the, all these uh, pictures that you take from the internet. How how you uh, you you mentioned it also that you need to sort of like in uh, enhance the image that you see from all the images that are going through that you sort of pick up a few that impact you and you have sort of the need to to address that. Uh, you you see the painting as sort of as a commentator as a reader. Uh, did you put those? A white squares within within the picture, or those were like also within within uh, already already in the picture itself. I I'm asking in terms of uh, sort of the copyright and and things that relate to when you took an image, how how much close you get to it, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm trying to be as faithful as possible. I didn't change anything about the images. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Texas immigration one is the second one there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, yeah, I do. Yeah, that's that one. So the white, the white squares were there. And in fact, the white squares were why I, why I even would paint it in a way. Um, mm -hmm. People's anonymity was protected. Um, but also this horrific process was kind of recorded through this image. So um that's what it is. As far as copyright goes, I mean, I um, I don't know. I'm painting them. I think it's fine. It's a fair use, um, and the painting of it is obviously a different thing than the photography of it. So, um, I haven't introduced any um, any variation or refinement or anything to the screen grab that I took, and I the canvases are built to be like exactly the size of the you know not the size but the scale mm -hmm. of um of the initial grab thank you along those lines Dushko, do you um do you find yourself wrestling with pixelation when you're grabbing things because i also find that to be really interesting too and in that so much of like the native land map as well as the um texas immigration painting have also that kind of pixelated element to it? Are there, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really dealt with it. I mean, it's funny, the next one I wanna do is the Bannon one and, and, and there I sort of wanna preserve um, the artist sketch, um, the courtroom sketch quality of it. Um, there hasn't been, I guess, let me put it this way. There hasn't been one where the pixelation that is present in all digital images has been the reason why I took the grab, you know, so it hasn't really been that um, present for me. Obviously the, 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 what do you call it? The deterioration of um, focus or all of that comes into play on some level, like, you know, not in native land map, cause that's a flat image, but 
in Texas immigration, there's a whole spatial thing where the camera, you know, the people in the front, you could paint each of their hairs and the people in the back, all you see is that they have hands. You don't see any, you know, you couldn't see a fingernail or something like that. So um, there is like the photographic information gathering is, is present in the image, but it's never really like, it never looked that pixelated um, when I took it, you know, and obviously, um, you know, with something like the blurred Israeli facilities there, that was like intentional blurring, you know, by, um, by a government agency. So um, I'm going to preserve that visual effect because that's key to understanding, you know, kind of how the image works. But um, in the other ones, you know, I, again, like I've just tried to stay faithful to how it looked to me when I, as a, as a computer user saw it as, you know, at like 10 inches from my face on a screen, you know? Yeah. But again, that's like totally inexact. I mean, I don't, I, I couldn't get a national science foundation grant for, for my visual methods for sure. <laughs> um, Uni is asking if you see a similarity in the way that you choose your images to paint and the works that you choose to publish or edit, i.e. as part of Paper Monument. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think, um, you know, um, I don't want to speak for Roger, but I think maybe we also have this in common, um, just as artists and as editors, and maybe also through working together over the years, I don't know. Um, there is a way in which um, I would say both in Paper Monument and DME and some of the paintings that I've made that I I'm kind of aware of general bigger problems that are, you know, would be described on the level of like social or historical problems, you know, like the adjunct crisis or, you know, we, our, our book that's about to come out is um, called Best Letters from Asian Americans in the Arts. And obviously like when Chris Ho and Daisy Nam came to us with that proposal um, a, a little bit over a year ago. It seemed incredibly pressing to us because of all the um, anti-Asian rhetoric that, that Trump was spewing and also in relation to COVID and all of that. So like, there's always like a, a kind of noticeable historical or social, you know, event or problem, but, um, I also have a real, I don't know how to describe it other than like a kind of, um, you know, a need or like a kind of propensity for um, some kind of efficiency or directness in confronting that need. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's Zoom or maybe I'm sounding crazy, but I feel crazy saying that, but that's like, that is kind of how I think. Like there's, there's always these big problems and I kind of, you know, wrestle with how to find a line into it. And sometimes that line is through some kind of humor or, you know, juxtaposition of, of incongruous visual styles or something like that. Um, I think with Paper Monument, it oftentimes involves like gathering some kind of community and, and asking them some shared questions, figuring out what those shared questions are. Um, and then in the paintings, you know, it's also this kind of, I guess, filtering system of like, just looking at a bunch of shit and then a, for some reason, not being able to drop some of it, you know, um, it's, I, I guess it's a little bit more personal and intuitive um, with the paintings, but the, I can feel in my brain, the same kind of mechanism functioning for better or for worse, a kind of like editorial mechanism of condensation and summary and something like that. Hello, Dushko. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Sure. Okay, and that is back to the um, Texas immigration. I don't know who's speaking. Oh, this Ben. Trotter. Oh, hi, Dr. Trotter. Hi, nice to see you. Sorry, I don't see the whole thing. That, that's okay. It's Thanks okay. for coming. 
Yeah, I'm enjoying this. Uh, back to the Texas immigration painting. What, what struck me when I first saw it was, uh, I thought, why did you, the artist, block out the, um, the faces? Right. And then when you said that's the way the government redacted that, I thought that was very uh, provocative of, of all kinds of reflections. And so, um, and I don't, I don't know exactly how one handles this, but uh, I, I like the idea of the viewer initially thinking that that's something you did, but then finding out that it's not something you did. Right, um, yeah. And I wonder how, how do you go about when you display this how, how can you signal that? Because um, I, I just found that very productive at a number of levels. Yeah, thanks for uh, saying that, yeah. Further about the, the white boxes too, the, uh, the whitening of the, uh, of, the, of, of the immigrants. Yeah, I, um, you know, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't totally gamed that out, um, but I think that it would, it would involve some kind of um, blanket statement for all of the images, which is, you know, just saying that I haven't changed them, you know, except to paint them as best I could, you know. So, um, you know, that the the I preserved, you know, the dimensions and the qualities of the of the original image and didn't introduce any um, anything other than a kind of translation into paint. Um, and, you know, and I think you're right, that would have to be maybe not the most prominent thing, but certainly a prominent thing so people would understand that I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't inserting these mm -hmm. qualities myself. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And Fernando has another question as well. Okay, so I was keep looking at the image and and it remind me a lot of a uh, Gabriel Orozco like you know with the circles like when he he sort of block uh you know the baseball photograph and the cars uh did you sort of make the connection while you were working with them or because the more and more I look to them it's just like just I make the straight the connections to that uh, which is something that you you didn't do. It just was like an image from the internet. So, yeah, it's a funny thing. Um, that's a really good question. I didn't make that particular quest that particular connection. Um, as I was working on it, I thought about Baltazari's dots. Um, mm. I thought about um, you know, I thought about government redactions of um of texts, you know, which are normally the black rectangles that have also been so ubiquitous, you know, in our visual culture as, you know, government malfeasance has seemingly increased. Um, and I, um, you know, there have also been uh, recent artistic projects. I'm blanking on that censorship project that was in the biennial a couple, the last biennial, but, um, you know, it's funny, like it's a ticklish thing because mm -hmm. um, the I, the fact that I'm not doing these moves myself, but that they relate to, you know, things that are from the art, the art zone, I think is interesting. The, um, maybe it's because I made it earlier and I've had more time to reflect on it. The map one, um, you know, really, started to remind me of different painting projects you know obviously jasper johns's maps mm -hmm. it's like a very it, it it's like as soon as you say it 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 has a very kind of uncontrovertible relationship to those paintings i didn't i didn't think of that the first time i saw it but obviously as as i painted it uh that occurred to me also um you know weirdly also like paintings very different paintings from around that same era that were that were stain paintings you know so frankenthaler you know color field 
kinds of paintings. Um, and it's weird, like I, in a way, I don't know what to make of that, except that I just sort of accept that those, those things hover over the image or are part of how um, the image works. And, you know, I love Jasper Johns. Um, you know, I think he's a tremendous and important artist. Um, I also started to see those map paintings pretty differently after I made this painting, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to like, you know, dunk on Jasper Johns or anything, but <laughs> but I did start to see like this weird kind of manic, um, God, I feel bad this is being recorded, but this kind of weird, I'll just be honest, like I felt this weird kind of manic um, obscuring of history and geography um, in some of those paintings when I thought about this other way of map making that you know, that they had done with the native land map project. So, you know, again, like I don't, I'm not trying to reject those map paintings, but I did feel like, okay, that's interesting. Um, by painting this, I started to think about those previous paintings a little bit differently. And, um, you know, staining is obviously like a super complex um, way of painting that's, you know, I wouldn't want to reduce it to this, particular reading, but, you know, there was a way in which I started to think more about these concepts of the blank canvas and, um, you know, in relationship to um, manifest destiny and things like that, right? So, um, you know, I definitely entered into that space um, as I was making the painting. It didn't, it didn't, it hadn't occurred to me um, in that particular way before I made the paintings. There's been a lot of back and forth between uh, Magda's noting uh, Jenny Holzer and um, the redacted text in her work. Um, That's true, but I'm actually thinking I'm terrible with names, but I'm thinking of that great um, uh, LA artist. Um, oh, what's her name? She's like one of my favorite artists. I can't remember her name. Um, uh, it was that censorship project that was in um, in the biennial. Ironically, it was like in the room catty corner to the Dana Schutz painting. Um, and it was that whole... Um, censorship book that had been redacted. I don't know, someone who's got a better memory for names. Bethany Collins, no, not Bethany Collins. <laughs> no, no, what's her name? Um, whenever I try to think of her name, Andrew Frazier's name blocks me. So it's probably Francis Stark. Thank you, hey. Roger. Yeah, Francis Stark, exactly. I was thinking of those Francis Stark, um, those, those works about censorship, but yeah, also Jenny Holzer, it's true. And I'm sure Ed Ruscha probably redacted something at some point. I don't know. Um, there's a great tradition of, of redactors. David Marzell was um, saying that it reminded him of Gerard Fromanger, a painter that um, Foucault wrote about as well. And yeah, I don't know that phrase, photogenic painting, but that seems really relevant. So I'll look into that. I think we've got time for maybe one more question if anybody has a less of a question, but a comment. I will say too, there's like this beautiful or interesting um, movement of time in your work. Like in thinking about sort of these journalistic photos that are taken just so quickly without really thinking through composition, et cetera. And then the screen grab itself, which is oftentimes just such a quick, I mean, it's a grab. And then you're taking those photos and then spending weeks to months on that same image. It's a really interesting sort of translation between time and the way that people have spent on each one of these. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really funny and almost uncanny that you say that because um... The weird thing is that um, when I went to graduate school, um, I went to Boston University and John Walker was my teacher. And John Walker's biggest put down for a painting 
uh, would be that it was journalistic. And, and, and that would mean that like someone had just kind of summarized things or they hadn't really looked at, into something and they were just kind of, you know, just flit, flitting across the canvas, you know, just um, kind of summarizing in this, you know, he called it journalistic way. It was always, it was really meant to sting uh, people. And then weirdly and, and like pretty unintentionally, I ended up teaching in a journalism program. <laughs> like I teach, you know, I chair and teach in this program called New Arts Journalism, um, you know, which I take seriously um, as a role, uh, but it wasn't one that I had particularly like sought out or really seen myself as a journalist in particular before I took that role. But I think taking that position and the way in which journalism has been so under siege um, in the Trump time period and uh, for various other economic and political reasons, you know, journalism just is so under siege. I've had this weird experience working on these paintings where I'm both like, you know, hearing, hearing that, that, you know, that, that John Walker critique of something, you know, merely being journalistic and on some level wanting to reclaim um, aspects of journalism that I feel are really valuable and overlooked and underappreciated, um, you know, for various uh, reasons right now. So it's, it's funny you say that because that's like kind of like X marks the spot. Like that's exactly where I am in terms of thinking through, um, you know, what the value of, of the journalistic enterprise and that kind of approach, um, what it means now online under these particular historical circumstances and stuff. That's kind of, um, yeah, and Mark is saying some artists should spend as much time as focused on subjects that compel them as many journalists do. And it's it's true. I mean, there's there are obviously various kinds of journalism. And um, yeah, so in a way, this is, weirdly kind of like a tribute to some journalistic images and some projects that are, you know, native land map is obviously, you know, an extremely deep project that goes way beyond journalism and um, the Texas immigration photo. I don't even know who took that photo because it was part of this government report, but, you know, kind of like, thank goodness someone was taking those photos, you know, they're, they're, they're really important to understanding what happened and you know what continues to happen. That's great. Any other questions before we close out? Okay. Jushko, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. This Thanks so much. Really great. Thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.